Okay, our next AML expert from MD Anderson is Dr. Nicola Short. Dr. Short is an assistant professor in the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is a clinical and translational investigator in adult leukemias with a particular emphasis on measurable residual disease and the development of phase one and two clinical trials of novel agents and combinations for patients with acute leukemias. Dr. Short has authored over 125 peer-reviewed manuscripts and numerous abstracts that have been presented at national and international conferences. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Short. All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's very nice to be able to speak directly to patients and I look forward as well to the uh, discussion at the end. Let me just get this. There you go, okay. So I'll be talking about uh, specifically at MD Anderson, how we use measurable residual disease or MRD. Uh, this is something that Dr. Kadia touched upon. We'll talk about the importance of MRD, how we use it to evaluate the effectiveness of our therapies, um, and also some novel strategies that we're using to eradicate this residual disease that might persist in some patients. These are my disclosures. So, uh, so first, just what is the definition of MRD? So MRD is basically essentially residual leukemia that is not detectable by our standard uh, you know, visual inspection of the bone marrow, but we can detect with more sensitive methodology. So for example, as Dr. Kadia showed, the, mo the majority of patients with AML, even with standard therapies, and now we're increasing those response rates, will achieve what's called a, a morphologic response, or even in some ways uh, called a complete response, which is kind of a misnomer. And this is often, this is defined as less than 5% blast in the bone marrow with or without uh, count recovery. Um, however, historically, most of these patients still relapsed, although I think we're improving the outcome, the outcomes now. And MRD can detect beyond this 5% cutoff. Importantly, as opposed to some of the genomic, uh, like the mutations and cytogenetic abnormalities, which are allow us inform our risk assessment for patients, this is a post-treatment uh, risk assessment. It's based on response. So it's we don't have this information when a, when a patient first uh, presents, but it's something that we can use to determine uh, how uh, effective has our strategy been in eradicating the MRD. So it's in some ways maybe even more, more important than some of those pretreatment characteristics because it really tells us in a particular patient's leukemia, how, has, how, how successful have we been? And this tells us a lot about the biology of, of that particular leukemia uh, and again, how adequate our therapy has been. So again, uh, MRD uh, used to be called minimal residual disease and now it's more, uh, more commonly called measurable residual disease to, to uh, really emphasize that it's it's all determined by the assays that we have, the tests that we have, and what are we actually able to measure with them. So just to orient you to this graph, you can think of a few different patient scenarios. So in the blue at the top, this is the leukemia that we can detect uh, under the microscope, okay? And then anything below that blue area are, are, are is, is a leukemia that we cannot detect microscopically by visual inspection, but we might, but we have uh, other tools such as MRD assays that we can use. So for example, you can think of these different scenarios. You have, for example, patient one who gets uh, some uh, type of therapy, uh, achieves what would typically be called a complete remission because when we look under the bone marrow, you can see there's a period of time where they're under that blue area where we would say, okay, great, this patient's in a, in a remission. However, uh, there's still residual disease uh, detect that we can detect with these other assays. Uh, and unfortunately, those patients will, will relapse unless we intervene upon it. So either do stem cell transplant or additional therapy. You can see patient two, where they, uh, again, they achieve a complete response, so they're below that blue area. Uh, and in fact, they even go low enough to the point where depending on our MRD assays, they may be MRD negative, meaning we can't detect it. That's in that uh, light gray area. But there are other, but, but eventually, uh, if we don't eradicate all of the leukemia, eventually they can have an MRD relapse, meaning initially we detect with uh, MRD positivity in the bone marrow, and then eventually have an uh, uh, overt relapse, meaning over 5% blast. And then you can imagine another scenario where you can see that depending on when you measure, that patient uh, goes into remission, maybe MRD positive, maybe initially, but then eventually converts to MRD negativity and with additional therapy, either additional chemotherapy or a transplant is eventually cured. The challenge is depending on when we assess these patients for MRD, we, we don't know which, which of these different scenarios they fall into. And so we have to integrate all of this along with our genome, the, the molecular and cytogenetic information as well as MRD information to make decisions about what to do for those patients, which we'll discuss. 
So there's a few different methods that we have to assess MRD and AML. So one is uh, cytogenetics of so conventional karyotyping. So most patients with AML will have an, ab will have an abnormal uh, cytogenetics at, at uh, presentation. Um, and then those are things that we can track in subsequent bone marrows. And if those persist, that's evidence of residual disease. But this is not a very sensitive uh, uh, technology. And in fact, we, we have much better uh, tools now. The one that we most commonly use in most patients with AML now is uh, multi-parameter flow cytometry. Uh, this can detect about one, uh, you know, among about 10,000 cells, it can detect one abnormal leukemia cell out of 10,000 normal cells. Uh, we can get this information back pretty quickly. Um, and again, unless someone has a very targetable mutation that, that, we're, um, that we're trying to track, this is what we use in most of our patients with AML. There's also molecular tests called PCR. So PCR can look for very specific uh, mutations or uh, 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 other um, genomic abnormalities. There's a, only a small subset of patients that have these. For example, the core binding factor leukemias, they have an, an, an abnormal transcript for inversion 16 or translocation 821. We use PCR for those patients, and that's a very good MRD marker. But there's only a minority of patients that have this marker that we can track. And then we have these next generation sequencing panels. And depending on the typical panel that we're using, the, the, the sensitivity can vary widely. Um, with the one that we use at MD Anderson, typically we only get a, a sensitive about 1%. This is actually looking for persistent mutations uh, in the bone marrow. Um, and these can also be a little misleading sometimes because there are some situations where mutations can persist, but they don't represent the actual leukemic clone. They represent actually a pre-leukemic clone that may not actually be MRD. So it's very challenging to interpret these next generation sequencing assays, but we look at all of this holistically and kind of come up with a general assessment in terms of how well has the leukemia responded. So I don't want to show a lot of different curves, I think, uh, or uh, these survival curves. I think the, the point of this is this is a large meta-analysis that we had done, which basically the meta-analysis takes a, a large number of studies that have looked at, for example, the, in, in this case, the impact of MRD and, and kind of combines all of the data together to, to come up with like a big picture uh, view of what's the impact of uh, MRD. And I think the main point is just to here to show that patients on average who are MRD negative do better than who are MRD positive. So we, our goal, it just highlights that our goal is to eradicate MRD in patients with, with AML. That being said, unfortunately, there are patients with M, who are, achieve MRD negativity who can still relapse. Uh, and, then, and then there are patients who are MRD positive, depending on when you measure it, who can still be cured as long as we intervene upon it and do stem cell transplant or additional therapies. So just to kind of summarize the prognostic impact of MRD and, and AML. So uh, again, we know that persistent MRD um, is, uh, is associated with overall worse outcomes, regardless of the type of subtype of, a, uh, of AML, where, where, whether it's, you know, quote unquote, favorable risk, intermediate risk, or adverse risk, uh, regardless of what method that we use, whether it's flow cytometry or PCR, uh, regardless of when we, when we actually look for the MRD, whether it's right after the first cycle of chemotherapy, whether it's later during consolidation, whether it's right before transplant or even after transplant. Now, most of the data that we have uh, for the impact of MRD is in patients who received intensive chemotherapy, but we do still now have some more emerging data that MRD is still very important even for older patients who, are not, who don't get intensive chemotherapy, who get lower intensive therapies. And also, even for patients who have relapsed refractory disease, who we are able to get back into remission, MRD is informative there. So overall, our goal of AML therapy is uh, to achieve MRD negativity, meaning we can't detect the disease with any of the assays that we have, and ideally also to get a full hematologic recovery. This is what's called historically called a full, a, a, a complete remission. So less than 5% blast, full count recovery, and then no evidence of residual disease with our MRD assays. Uh, all of that together is really the goal of AML therapy, because we know that that strongly correlates with better long-term outcomes. But again, it's important to remember that our MRD tests are not perfect. Um, as I mentioned before, there are patients who are MRD negative who unfortunately can still relapse, and there are patients who are MRD positive who can be cured. But it is an important tool that we use uh, to decide potentially on next steps for an individual patient. And so that's what I really want to talk about is what are the therapeutic implications of MRD? So I've, I've said, you know, it's better to be MRD negative than MRD positive, but what do we actually do? So importantly, MRD can help to us in, to decide on whether a patient should be transplanted in first remission. So uh, for example, uh, favorable patients with favorable risk AML 
Those would be, for example, the core binding factor leukemias. Uh, we often recommend transplant only if those patients have persistent MRD positivity. So if they uh, uh, clear their MRD very quickly, then we often recommend chemotherapy alone and no transplant. We can also consider not doing transplant in first remission for patients who are considered intermediate risk AML based on the cytogenetic and uh, genetic features that Dr. Kadia had discussed. Uh, if they achieve MRD negativity. But that's an individualized decision that really requires a discussion with the patient, the leukemia doctor, and the transplant doctor. I won't go into a lot of detail, but it can actually inform, MRD can inform the type of transplant potentially. So whether or not a patient is MRD positive or negative going into transplant might uh, uh, inform the, the stem cell source that might be used or the intensity of the transplant conditioning, which Dr. Oran may discuss. And for patients who are either not candidates for transplant or who elect not to, not to undergo transplant, there are other options that we have for MRD-positive disease. Some of those include hypomethylating agents that would include azacitidine or decitabine with or without venetoclax. And we also have a number of MRD-directed clinical trials. So this is a study of uh, oral azacitidine, and I just want to highlight just some relevance to MRD. But basically, essentially, this is a study of, of older patients who had received intensive chemotherapy who were not eligible for transplant. And then they were randomized to receive either oral azacitidine, which is CC486, or placebo. And importantly, there was a benefit for patients who would receive maintenance therapy with the oral azacitidine, and this led to an FDA approval as maintenance therapy. And also when they looked back at, at the patients and their MRD status at the time when they were randomized and received either the azacitidine or placebo, they found that the uh, oral azacitidine was able to convert patients from MRD positive to MRD negative uh, in over a third of the cases. And importantly, they also saw that the use of this oral azacitidine was, uh, and the benefit of it was, was independent of MRD status. So in other words, it showed really that we can intervene upon in, in MRD positive patients and convert them from MRD positive to MRD negative and improve their outcome. So this is one of the, the best, highest quality data that we have to support the, the intervention on MRD uh, outside of the use of, for example, stem cell transplant. So uh, we have a number of clinical trials at uh, MD Anderson for MRD positive AML. Uh, Dr. Kadia, oh, Dr. Kadia has a study of azacitidine plus venetoclax. Uh, this would be appropriate primarily for patients who hadn't received these drugs uh, previously. Uh, we also have a study of vibicotamab. Vibicotamab is a bispecific antibody that, that targets CD3 and CD123. So it targets basically CD3 is on T cells. Those are the immune cells. And it also targets CD123, which is uh, which is present on a lot in many patients uh, present on the AML of uh, you know leukemia, uh, and it basically brings the the T cells close to the uh, AML cells and and triggers the T cells to you know kill the the AML cells. So it's an immune based therapy that we're using for patients who are, have uh, MRD positive disease. We also have a number of natural killer cell therapies. These are not this is not chemotherapy. This is cellular therapy. Uh, that uses natural killer cells, which are a type of cell that we all have in our body that is that is good at uh, killing uh, foreign uh, cells, such as AML. Uh, and as, and we have a number of uh, studies that allow for patients who are MRD positive, uh, and I think on clinical trials, and this is very important to uh, consider for our patients. So what's our general approach to MRD monitoring and decision-making in AML? So if I had to summarize it for uh, our general approach at MD Anderson, I have a couple slides just to show, and this is this is my approach, but I think most of my colleagues would agree with this. So first of all, uh, practically, how do we select the MRD assay for an individual patient? So as I mentioned, for patients with core binding factor leukemia, those would be inversion 16 or translocation 821. We have a very good PCR molecular assay to, to monitor these fusion transcripts. Um, we can do this in the peripheral blood, and sometimes we do. Uh, the bone marrow in general is a better source for this. So Whenever possible, we want to get a bone marrow to be assessing MRD uh, uh, with the PCR for core binding factor AML. But in some situations when a patient may not be due for a bone marrow, uh, we can do peripheral blood monitoring. For essentially almost all other patients who uh, have AML, we really rely predominantly on flow cytometry. Um, flow cytometry really should needs to be performed on the bone marrow. So we are still, so still as we as we monitor MRD for these patients, we really do need to get. Uh, bone marrows, and I'll talk about the frequency in a bit. Uh, we do have a few other assays that can be done for, for, for select groups, but we use this in combination flow cytometry. So for example, for patients with, who have flick mutations, 
uh, we can do PCR for FLT3 and we can integrate that along with our, uh, with our flow cytometry to get a better assessment of the MRD status. And as I mentioned, we have these next generation sequencing panels that look for mutations. These are often performed in the remission marrows, but we have to interpret them with caution because sometimes these mutations that we see even in remission don't represent actual MRD and their leukemia, but might represent more of a pre-leukemic state that we are not able to generally eradicate in the absence of stem cell transplant. And these may not have the same prognostic significance. So it's important uh, to you know, take into account the types of mutations that you have on this panel, um, and we have to really think about this and be very cautious in terms of how, how we make decisions based on some of these uh, persistent mutations. As far as timing of MRD assessment, in general, for any patient with newly diagnosed AML undergoing chemotherapy, we will always uh, assess MRD at the end of the first cycle of induction. And then generally, we do every cycle until MRD negativity. And then after that, usually every uh, you know, three to four months, at least for the first uh, couple of years. So for patients who don't go to, go to transplant, who are just getting chemotherapy, as I mentioned, about every two to three, two to four months uh, for a couple of years. For patients who are transplanted, we always want to know the MRD status prior to transplant because that might inform some of those decisions about conditioning intensity or other things. And then after transplant, that'll be for the transplant doctors because usually the, at, at MD Anderson, they'll go and be followed primarily by the transplant doctor after transplant. But generally they would wanna get MRD again about every two to four months for the first one to two years after transplant. So what are some indications for uh, transplant in MRD positive AML? So for core binding factor leukemias, there's some specific numbers, but essentially, as I mentioned, we don't typically transplant patients with core binding factor AMLs but we do well if they have persistent MRD positivity and we have, a, we have some cutoffs that we use at different times. If we see uh, at greater than 1.1% after one to two cycles, we would sometimes consider that or if at MRD positive uh, after they've received all of their treatment. For some patients who are considered favorable risk who don't have core binding factor leukemia, um, we would do flow cytometry. We do flow cytometry and we might consider those patients even though they're quote unquote favorable risk we might consider them for transplant if they still have persistent MRD after one to two cycles, uh, if they get a high intensity regimen, or, may, or maybe after two to four cycles, if they get a lower intensity regimen. But these are really individualized decisions that need to be discussed with the patient, the leukemia doctor, and the transplant doctor. For patients who are not candidates for transplant or who don't just elect that they say that they don't want to do transplant, as I mentioned, enrollment at a clinical trial is really important. We have a number of these studies, as I mentioned. Um, and I think it's very important to try to eradicate the disease with these other more effective, you know, therapies that we're hoping are going to be more effective uh, than the standard of care. And then for patients uh, who have MRD that arises after transplant, for example, again, we want to enroll these patients on clinical trials. We have the same kind of options as I discussed before, and I know that our stem cell transplant colleagues also have another study of some immunotherapies, uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab, which can be considered for patients who are MRD positive after transplant. You can also consider what are called donor lymphocyte infusions for patients who are MRD positive. This is basically like, a re, like giving back those T cells that were initially given at the time of transplant from the original donor to try to stimulate that graft versus leukemia effect to eradicate this small amount of leukemia that might persist. So in conclusion, uh, you know, MRD is very highly prognostic in AML across clinical contexts. So we know that in general, it's better to be MRD negative than MRD positive. Uh, our goal of therapy in AML is to achieve a complete remission and also to achieve MRD negativity. Uh, MRD, neg uh, MRD is not only prognostic in AML, but it also informs our therapeutic decision-making. So for example, we use MRD information to potentially decide on whether or not a patient would be, you know, we would recommend transplant to them. It might inform the type of transplant or the type of transplant conditioning. And for patients who are not candidates for transplant, it, it, will, it opens up the possibility of doing uh, some maintenance therapies or, or some of the clinical trials that we have. And I think it's really important to emphasize that I think enrollment of in, in patients uh, who are MRD positive into clinical trials is very important because I, I didn't, we didn't talk about this much, but in ALL, another type of leukemia, we actually have a drug that's approved. It's called blintumab, which is a bispecific antibody that is now FDA approved for eradicating MRD. And that actually improves survival. And we're really wanting, we really need to develop the same thing in, for our patients with AML as an option, particularly for patients who can't go to transplant. So enrollment in clinical trials uh, is really imperative. And with that, I'll conclude and again, looking forward to the uh, Q&A at the end.